أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. Thank you for tuning in on this late night, and I just finished traveling from overseas. And you know, when you travel overseas, your body gets used to a different time zone, and you know, so you come back to your country, you're wide awake. But then uh, everybody else is sleeping. But you can't sleep because your body has gotten used to a different time zone. So I'm going to take the, uh, this opportunity while I'm wide awake to share with you uh, some of my thoughts on my recent trip to Marrakesh. One of my Facebook friends asked me, are the Fulani still in Morocco? Which is very a very interesting question because... That was a part of my findings when I recently went to uh, Morocco. And um, so I want to briefly go over, um, you know, the history of this, this country and uh, basically the history of this, this particular region. As you know, in the, the seventh century, uh, the Umayyads made their way over to North Africa. And um, when they did so, they established this great empire uh, that stretched all the way from, you know, southern Spain, going all the way east, you know, to the Arabian Peninsula and uh, to ancient Persia, which is, uh, you know, Iraq, Iran, and those areas. Very, very huge empire. But when they went into southern Spain, it was the Berbers. It was Tariq, the, the Moor, as they call them. And, uh, you know, the native, 10,000 native Berbers from North Africa. They basically went into southern Spain on behalf of the Umayyad Islamic Empire. And they conquered southern Spain. They opened up southern Spain for the Umayyads. Once they opened up southern Spain for the Umayyads, the, the Arab component of the Umayyads came in and it was like basically they said thank you and they dissed them and dismissed them. You know, they used them, then they excused them. It's like, okay, thank you for, you know, opening this territory for us. Thank you for, you know, uh, conquering and, and uh, coming in. And now we could establish our Umayyad kingdom there. And they begin to push the Berbers out. So from the very beginning, there was this conflict between the, the Arabs and the Berbers because there wasn't an equal power sharing. So the, the, the Arabs, basically, they, you know, justify their rule and... The Berbers, you know, automatically gave deference to the Arabs because these are the companions, the descendants of the companions of our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So, uh, you know, of course they have the right to rule. Of course they are qualified to rule because they descend from the, the noble families of the East. And I want you to pay attention to that notion, uh, how the justification for ruling is based on noble lineage, which is all throughout history. However, the Berbers wanted their place in the Islamic empire, even though they gave deference to them, but they were not only, uh, um, you know, at a lower position, they were actually pushed out of Spain. And at some point they were barred from Spain. So when you have that type of dynamic, of course it's gonna build a sort of resentment and that resentment was building for, for years where you had the, the Berbers and the Arabs, they were fighting each other. You know, this is going back from the 7th century, the 8th century, the 9th century, the 10th century, so forth. So, you come to the 11th century. And during the 11th century, you have Ibn uh, Tashman, of the uh, Ibn Yasin, excuse me, of the Al Morabit, the Al Murabitun. And um, 
He wants to establish a kingdom for the Berbers inside of North Africa since they are the native people. So he couldn't get no help up there in uh, you know, the north. So he came down to another Islamic empire which had established himself early on. So while the Umayyads were up in the north in the, the succeeding uh, Arab dynasties up in the north, there was a, a black Islamic dynasty forming quietly further south in southern Mauritania in Senegal. And this would be the first Islamic empire in West Africa. So when Ibn Yasin to take back control for his people up in that area, he came to the south and he asked for help. And you're going to see this pattern all throughout the history of Morocco, where they come south to ask for help. So when they came to ask for help, they came to a people called the Takaroa people. The Takaroa people. And I noticed that in the history, Takaroa is, is it's very, very little known, but Ta the Takaroa Empire is of extreme importance. So he comes to the Takaroa. The Takaroa as many historians have identified, was a Fulani empire. It's a Fulani established empire. The Takwa people are said to be Fulani people. So they, they don't even know when this particular empire began. But Ibn Yasin, he came to us for help. Now, there were Berber tribes that were not yet converted to Islam. And it was the Takroa that helped to convert the, uh, they call them the rebellious Gudala Berber tribes and the Lamtuna Berber tribes. So here was the Fulani, the Takroa, that helped to convert them. And once they became converted, they formed this alliance called the Al Murabitun known in history as the al -Muravids. That's a corruption of the word al murabitun the Arabic word al murabitun So these Berbers in Takra, they come together and they go up into, uh, you know, this northern area and they conquer. And they establish Marrakesh. That is the beginning of what is known today as Morocco. Before that, there was no Morocco. The real name for Morocco is Marrakesh. And it was established by the Berber and the Takroa people. So from the very, very beginning, the Fulani people were involved in the establishment of Marrakesh. So when you see me travel there, don't think I'm becoming some Arabicized Negro who wants to, you know, to uh, fit into some Arab society. No, I'm going to a homeland that was once established, that was established by my ancestors. And that's why I feel very comfortable there. But later on, the narrative changes. Now, let me pause for a second in the history if you go to Egypt today, for instance, you will see a preponderance of Arab people. And if you don't know the history, you would think, well, there's so many Arabs there today. These must be the original people of this territory. But the Arabs themselves will tell you, no, we're not the original people. We came, you know, during the, the Umayyad period and we conquered this basic territory and they've been there ever since. The real people, the Nubian people, have been pushed to the south. And they are marginalized. They're not a part of the political uh, authority. They're not a part of the, the ruling class. But these are the original people of the country. These are the people that built the country, the pyramids, the sphinx, and the, the ones you see on the wall. These, these are the ones, but they're not visible to you. They're relatively invisible and in the South. You have that same type of situation in Morocco today. 
the people that are visible to you when you go to Morocco are not the original people who founded the country. These are the people that came. These are the, some of them are Arabs. Some of them are descendants of, the, of Spain when, uh, during 1492 when they pushed the Muslims out. You had a lot of Spanish Muslim converts. These are good people now. They're beautiful people. But when the narrative is told about the blacks, they're told that the blacks were brought there as slaves. This is a racist narrative that you find throughout the Arab world. Even when you go to, to Syria and Iraq, the original people, they are black, but they'll tell you that all blacks that are there, they were brought there as slaves. They are Abdis. So here it is, the Takroor, the ones who are responsible for establishing the country, and they're known as full bay people today, Fulani people today. If you go into Moroccan narratives, they will be known as slaves, which is an incorrect narrative, and that narrative has to be changed. So we go forth, you go to the, the 14th century, and you always see this interaction between the, the Takroor Empire and Marrakesh during the, the period of Mansa Musa and the rule of his brother, uh, which I got into a lot of trouble because I said Mansa Musa was a Takroor. And a lot of you think I'm mistaken because according to uh, uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of people who research the history of Mansa Musa, they go to the Tariq al-Fatash, which was written if I'm not, if I recall correctly, in the 17th century. In the writer of Tariq al-Fatash, he's the one that has these names, uh, you know, Kankan Musa, Musa Kada, um, you know, the, these names that attribute him and make him uh, demanding. And so this is really the main source that people get their history from. But you have to understand that Mansa Musa existed in the 14th century, the 1300s, and the Tariq al-Fatash was written nearly 400, three to 400 years after that. And the writer of Tariq al-Fatash says that a lot of the stories about Mansa Musa during his time, uh, the 17th century, are lies. He says they are lies. He says these are fabricated stories about him. And then he starts to tell the fabricated stories. And it is from these fabricated stories, some are true, some are not, that are used as the primary source to identify Mansa Musa as Kan Kan Musa, Musa Keda. But if you go to the people who were alive to the 14th century, during the 1300s, you have Ibn Khaldun. He was alive then. He was alive when Mansa Musa was alive. You have Shabab al-Umari. He was alive during the time when Mansa Musa was alive. So these are the ones that should be used as what's called primary source. And they identify him as coming from a long lineage of Takrur rulers who have been making Hajj to Mecca going back to a time where they don't know where it began. So this Takwa Empire was in existence during the time, and again, they were responsible for establishing Marrakesh. So going all the way up to the 14th century, the Takwa Empire was still there. And Mansa Musa and his brother, when the king of Morocco passed away, they, 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 they grieved for him, they had a ceremony for him in Takwa and Mali because they were closely related. This connection was still there in the 14th century. Mansa Musa had an alliance with Berber tribes. Now the Takro and the Berber had always been aligned from the beginning of Marrakesh in establishing Marrakesh. And all the way up, 300, 400 years later, they're still aligned during the time of Mansa Musa, these Takro and these Berbers. When you read their history, these tribes are closely aligned. 
the trading between the Takro and Mali empires of, you know, of textiles and the Takro being cattle breeders. And they, they bred the, the, the beautiful Arabian horses that were sold in Marrakesh and were sold all the way in the east, going all the way to Mecca and Egypt and all the way there. Even the textiles of the, the, the Takro people were sold all the way to the east. And the gold, of course, of ancient Mali was also sold in Marrakesh and all the way into the east. In Morocco today, you have the Kutubia Mosque, which is almost a thousand years old now. I love, I prayed in that mosque so many times. And uh, the Kutubia Mosque, which I will show you pictures, inshallah, in the near future, was uh, originally supposed to be built under the al Murabi tomb, but was it built under the al uh, uh, al as they call them, or the, the, uh, the, the space from the word Wahid. Uh, the, the oneness, that preached the oneness of God. Now, the books coming from Timbuktu going all the way up to K the Ketubia and this trade of books, which was a very valuable commodity. So this interaction between ancient Takroa and Mali was, was uh, well established for centuries before this one called Moulay Ismail in the 17th century. Now, according to Moroccan history, the Fulani, the Bambara, uh, the Songharis, and these people were enslaved by Moulay Ismail and brought into his black army. The black army ruled Morocco. And even when Moulay Ismail died, it was the black army they're composed of Fulani and Song Harris and, uh, you know, the, 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 the blacks coming from Mali and these places. They picked the rulers. They were in power. And they, they, according to the history, this is when the blacks or the Fulani first came to Morocco. That is not true. They were there from the beginning. They were, they were, they were doing trade and commerce all throughout the centuries. And they were there during the Sidian period, and they were well established in the south of Morocco. Now, the Sidians came before Moulay Ismail, the Sidian dynasty. And among the Sidians are one of the last and greatest rulers of Morocco called Ahmed al Mansur, whose empire ran from Marrakesh all the way to Mali. Now, in history, they say that this was the Arab conquest of Mali. Ahmed al Mansur comes from the south, the Draw Valley. In fact, most of the rulers of Morocco come from southern Morocco. Southern Morocco is black. These are the nomads, you know, these are the Tuaregs, the Berbers. And among southern Morocco, during the Sidian period, which was like the 1603, Ahmed al-Masur's mother was a Fulani woman. And this is recorded in uh, the Tariq al-Sudan. But in the Tariq al-Sudan, they said that she was a jariat or a concubine of, of Ahmed al um, Ahmed al Mansour's father. But I went to the library in Rabat and I read the Histoire du Maroc, which was in the French language, and I had to do some translation. And in the Histoire du Maroc, Leila Masuda, a Fulani woman, comes from a noble family in the South. So she's a Fulani woman that comes from a noble Fulani family that existed in the south of Morocco. This noble woman was so educated, she was considered an Islamic scholar. And she built a mosque that is in Marrakesh up until this day. It stands in a neighborhood called Babs Dukala, 
which I have been, and I, I, I have photos on my page, which I will share with you again, in Bob's Dukala, the masjid that she built still stands. She built it and she maintained it from her money. And she was considered an Islamic scholar and she came from a noble family. This is not a jariat. This is not a concubine. This is not a slave woman. But in, you read the, the history, the narrative that is being told, all blacks came as slaves. And this is far, far from the truth. And unfortunately, the greatest music in Morocco today, they have a big festival every year. It's called the, the Ganawa. They sing about their Fulani ancestors, their Bambara ancestors, their Song Harris ancestors. And they, they, they make this click sound that they came in chains and enslaved. But the reality of it is much different. It's the same when Morocco was established, how Ibn Yasin came to the black, to the Takroa Empire for help. Same with uh, Mulai Ishmael. He came to get help from the soldiers and the blacks of Mali, which included the Tuareg, the Fulani, the Song Harris, the Bambara, to establish his kingdom. They didn't come as slaves. I mean, just think about how foolish it would be. You know, Mule Ishmael comes, you know, into Mali and enslaves the people and say, okay, here's some weapons, come fight for me. I'm going to fight for you. You enslave me. You give me a gun and you tell me to fight for you. No, I'm going to shoot you. I mean, that's just, just, just common sense. These are warriors. Uh, uh, no, I'm, I'm, you're not going to enslave me and give me a gun and tell me to fight for you. No. He came and asked for help. They came and supported him and they ruled Morocco. The black army. And for many years, it was just the black guard in Morocco. Only blacks were in the army inside of Morocco. And in fact, it was during these time periods, during the transatlantic slave trade, when they was capturing slaves, bringing them to the West. These soldiers were capturing slaves from Europe. And you should look it up. It's called the Barbary slave trade. And there are a lot of whites who were enslaved in Morocco. So when they were enslaving us, Moroccans, the people of Marrakesh, retaliated and was enslaving them. So in Morocco today, you have descendants of these slaves. And some of them are, you know, uh, considered high class or whatever. Some of them are, are in the South as well. Uh, and some, of you know, uh, I know a, a brother from Morocco. He did his DNA. He thought he was Arab or, or something. And it turned out he was Spanish or, or Swedish, and he was of European ancestry. He was shocked that he was of European ancestry. He thought he was a native to North Africa. But a lot of people in Morocco are descendants of these people who were captured and enslaved inside of Morocco by the Black God and others. So the narrative has drastically changed. Where the founders of Morocco... The, those who are involved in the trade and the commerce and the building of Morocco from the very beginning are now as slave people. So where are these Fulani people today? They're not under the name Fulani anymore. When I was in the market of Marrakesh, I was speaking to a particular brother. I was with my wife, who is a Fulani woman. And when she saw this, this brother, she said this... She, she thought he was a pulo. So we sat down and we spoke with him. And as we began to speak with him, his village is in the south. And he began to describe the women of his village. And he described the, what we call in Fulani culture, the horde or the tumude. He began to describe the role that that plays in the woman's household. Because in Fulani women, with Fulani women, that, that horde, which is called the calabash, is of utmost importance. It's decoration. It has a history that goes all the way back to ancient Egypt. 
and beyond, which I'll get into at another time, inshallah. And so when he was describing the role they played and he was describing the dish that they make, my wife said, I know that dish, that's called chopal. In Pula, it's called chopal. And then he, you know, he was describing the the way the, the his village is organized and the role that the women play. And my wife said, that's exactly Fulani. Then he showed us the picture of the coins that the women wear on their head, the same that the Fulani women wear. So we asked him, you know, well, where, where are your people from? He said, the Yemen. And me and my wife looked at each other and said, no, this, this guy, he's Fulani. And uh, because his culture is Fulani, you look at his face, it's Fulani. Even the clothes he wore, I, I like the Fulani, the, the clothes the Fulani wear in Mauritania. Uh, you see it on my, go to my Facebook page. I'm actually wearing his garb. That's not mine. I'm wearing his. And um, all of this points to the Fulani. So what seems to happen is the same thing that happened with the Fulani in the Sudan. They begin to assimilate, to change their name and, and integrate into the culture of Morocco. And they say they are from the Yemen. Now, this whole thing of tracing your heritage back to the East, as I said earlier in this presentation, that in order to justify ruling over the Muslim people as the Umayyads that came, and because they were from, you know, uh, descent from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and from the tribes of the, the East, they were given deference to rule. But it is with truth that they have left their bloodline here uh, not here, but inside of Morocco. And um, so when the al Murabitun and the blacks from the Draw Valley and from the south begin to rule, they also claim their lineage to the east in, to, in order to justify them ruling over this Muslim empire. And that story sticks to this day. So you find people and you can look at them and you examine their culture, you examine their community culture, and you say, oh, these are exactly Fulani people. But they'll tell you there's something else. They don't have their cows because the desert has encroached so the cows can't survive there, so they'll have camels. They'll have sheep probably, but they won't have all of their, the, the type of cattle that they had when they originally came there because the desert has encroached. So they have to change their type of animals. But their lifestyle, their culture, and even their features, they'll tell you that they are from the people who have been there all along. And you see it on the faces of Moroccan people when you go to Marrakesh. And, but if you ask them, they'll tell you, no, we're, we're, we're Arabs, we're from... You know, we're from the east, we're from someplace else. So that's basically where they are. The, the Fulani people did not disappear. They have just integrated, they have assimilated into that society and they're under different names. And some of them still greet Tanala Lonk, which means the same as Tanala Tong. It's the greeting is still the same. So that's basically it. And, and, and I, I hope to give more details uh, at a future time. So thank you for listening. I hope you learned something from this presentation. And I look forward to talking to you again. Salaam alaikum.